Okay, hi guys. Uh, welcome to another episode of the World Hackout Podcast. Uh, today is our weekend edition. So, uh, we are having a uh, CEO of World Financial. Uh, let me just go right ahead and invite him. Hi. Hey, how's it going? Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, I think it's afternoon where you are. It's already evening there. Yeah. How are you doing? Living the dream. Living the dream. Appreciate you having me on. All right. Uh, oh, firstly, uh, I'll introduce myself. My name is Chubby uh, Daniel. Uh, I'm the uh, host of the World Podcast Podcast. Uh, the podcast is where we teach people how to invest in the financial industry. We talk about assets from stocks to uh, cryptocurrencies and all that. Uh, let me just give you the opportunity to uh, let yourself uh, be known by a guest. Uh, so, who are you and uh, how did you get into the investment world? Sure. So, my name is Gav Blacksburg, and I'm the COO and the voice of Wolf Financial on the internet. Wolf Financial is, of course, the startup that I work for, and we're designing a app that's kind of like Twitter crossed over with an investment research platform. So. We got tired of everybody going on Twitter, finding these great tickers and saying, all right, now I have to go somewhere else and research it and said, all right, let's just do it all in the same place. My background in getting into investing, I have a bachelor's in finance from Drexel University, uh, started investing actually with Snapchat IPO'd. Uh, I really loved the app at the time. So I said, I want to invest in that. I think it's going to be a good long-term buy. Um, so I'm up 400% on that. So I guess it was uh, a good buy and you know, made a brokerage account and then around like two, three years ago, really started putting in more money into it. And then obviously, once um, I got a little bit closer to graduation, I had a bit more money. I had you know, paid off some of my student loans and also started building this app. I got much more seriously into investing. And then I started the Wolf Financial Twitter in August, I think, of last year. And we're up to almost around 6,000 followers. And so now it's just an everyday lifestyle. Okay. Uh, uh, your profile said you uh, work with uh, Goldman Sachs. Uh, can you just tell us a little bit about how that experience? How did it go for you? Or was there uh, did, I'm not sure. I, it's, the sound's breaking up a little bit for me. Did you say, how did we start Wolf Financial? Or what is, were you asking about the company? Well, I'm asking about your experience with uh, Goodman. Goodman Sachs. My experience with what? One more time, sorry. Trying to hear. Okay, <laughs> uh, you have uh, a financial, uh, your, your, your profile says you work with uh, Goodman. Goodman Sachs. Wolf Financial. Uh, I, uh, maybe, uh, yeah, I'm not sure if I'm hearing the word right. You're asking my experience with something, right? <laughs> Your experience uh, with Goodman, Goodman, Goodman. Sachs. Goodman. Is that what you said? Yeah. Yes, yeah. Uh, my experience with Goodman. Um, I'm, I'm not necessarily sure. Which Goodman are you referring to? Okay. Uh, your profile is that you work with uh, Goodman, Sachs, the investment firm. Oh, oh, yes, 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 yes. Apologies, I was mishearing it. Yes. Okay, okay. yeah. So, um... Yeah, so I did work at Goldman Sachs uh, for about six months in the private wealth management division. Um, I was working on three different teams there, managing about six billion AUM, um, working under three fantastic private wealth manage, uh, managers. And so I worked as a financial analyst for them. Uh, my job was, uh, I think private wealth management is a lot of sales kind of crossed over with investment management because you're talking with people who are uh, multimillionaires, billionaires on the phone each day and just, um, essentially reassuring them of their positions, talking them through market movements. So if the market had a drastic day and their portfolio was up or down $30 million, you know, at 10 a.m., you got to kind of explain to them why, um, what's happening there. And, you know, I learned a lot from there. That, that was really where I feel like I built my base for finance was Goldman. That's where they taught me how to build a portfolio properly. So how to balance out for the long-term equities, uh, putting in real estate, alternative assets, and all those different types of areas. So you know, I credit Goldman for giving me a really strong base. However, um, you know, I, I really am an independent person and I like to be able to work my own schedule, my own times, um, communicate with who I want to communicate with. I don't like 
if you work at Goldman, you understand that there's a lot of compliance, which means I wouldn't even be able to do this call, right, if I worked at Goldman. And you don't have the opportunity to really get out there and talk to people and network and make a, you know, make your own impact because you have to follow a lot of company regulations. So for me, um, I really appreciate what I learned from Goldman, but to me, it wasn't necessarily the long-term step because I wanted to do something where I was much less restricted in the world of finance. Okay, uh, before we get into uh, the, the world financial, uh, I just want to ask, uh, what is your own investment strategy? So how do you invest? Uh, do you see yourself as a long-time investment guy or do you uh, prefer trading uh, the short-term volatility and you just uh, take advantage of the market? What's your own strategy? Yeah. Yeah, so I have different accounts for different strategies. Um, so I have a Roth IRA account, which is a purely long-term strategy. Um, I try to hold around 10 names in there uh, total, and those are all long-term holds for me. So, um, you know, I can try to pull it up real quick just to see, um, you know, what some of those names are. But essentially, I hold things like I think that there's a, a ton of value in the housing market. So I hold like Zillow Group and Open in there. Um, I also like the semiconductors. So I have like Kulik and Sofa. Um, for insurance, I have Lemonade um, and a couple of other names. So those are for me long-term holds, uh, Walmart, Skills, things like that. And then I also have um, a Robinhood account, which I use for um, a mix between long-term and swing trading. So sometimes in the Robinhood account, I'm moving stuff out. I also do use it for crypto um, trading. I, I do do a significant amount of crypto trading. I just find that it's easier. There's no there's no fees. My trades go through on time. I'm just used to using the app. So if somebody else built a better interface with no fees, I would use them. But they just have me because of that. So those are two of my accounts. And then I actually do have a third account uh, with E-Trade that I use for trading OTCs. Um, and that's something that I've more recently gotten into with just picking up, you know, 10,000, 20,000 units of something that's worth small. And those are those are typically not long-term holds. Um, those are me waiting for a catalyst to happen. So I communicate with a lot of different areas of Twitter. Um, there's a lot of people who are extreme investment analysis down to the nitty gritty. And then there's people that are just looking for the next big thing, the catalyst, the jump. And I actually appreciate all of the approaches. Um, I don't I don't try to distance myself from any group uh, as long as what I believe that they're doing is legal um, and you know ethical. Uh, so I, I think that there are people that are really doing life-changing things in all of these different areas, whether it's long-term swing or day trading. And so I'm just trying to learn from all of them because I have plenty of time, so I don't see a need to pigeonhole myself into a specific area. Okay, uh, uh, let me, uh, before I get into it, because you mentioned it, so how did you get into the whole Twitter thing? Because you are like really having a lot of, uh, of time, a like good time on Twitter. Uh, how did you get into the market, uh, market madness? How did you start all that? Market Madness was just an idea that came to me. So I, you're talking about the tournament, right? The tournament where we pitted. Yeah, yeah. so I'm a, I'm a big sports guy. And I've always, uh, for the past several years, I play fantasy. I listen to sports podcasts every day. I'm pretty up to date. I'm following the NFL draft right now. Uh, I can tell you basically every team, what I think their chances are, their players, their positions. Um, I can do schemes, schematics, talk strategy, so that type of stuff. So for me, um, I don't, do a lot of college basketball, but March Madness is my college basketball experience. And last year, of course, it was not, it didn't happen. It just didn't happen. It got canceled because of COVID. And I was trying to like, figure out, is anybody going to take advantage of this? The fact that there's so many people who used to fill out brackets and they're not now. And I found one person on Twitter that did like a, me like a meme bracket where it was like, vote for your favorite memes. And they got so many people filling it out. And then this year, about a month or five weeks before when March Madness usually starts, I'm sitting there and I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, I don't even know if March Madness is going to happen this year, right? We were in a bit of a crossover stage. They could have shut it down if a bunch of cases came up. Teams like Duke were saying we might not play. Um, and I was just sitting there going, all right, I'm doing everything for stocks. I have all the connections. I have all the people. I have developers. I have designers because of my team building the app. And I just came to me. I was like, what if I just built March Madness for stocks? And just sat down with my team and really just started working and grinding. And I spent like 70 hours a week working on the idea for about four or five weeks and was able to just build the website, get the connections, back it, promote it, get sponsorships. And obviously it became a reality. And finally it's, it just finished. So that was a lot of time. All right. Okay. Let me just, uh, I, I noticed you've been using Twitter spaces a lot. Uh, what do you think about the Twitter spaces? And what do you think is the prospect in the future? And uh, what uh, certain development do you think can be made to uh, Twitter spaces to make it uh, to suit you better? Uh, I'm sorry, it's uh, the the sound broke up for me again. <laughs> okay, 
I apologize. Tweet and Facebook. Tweet and Tweet and Facebook. We are making use of it. What do you think is the oh, this... improvement, improvement that can be done to Twitter Spaces? Uh, and where do you see it going in the future? Where do you see it going? Right, right. So that's a good question because I actually did have a meeting with Twitter, uh, with the Twitter Spaces team on Thursday. I sat down uh, and talked with them over a video call. And I see a lot of potential for Twitter spaces. Obviously, I'm taking advantage of them every single day to the fullest extent of my ability. I think that, you know, the way I'm doing it is a little bit different because I organize panels and I moderate panels. And I try to make sure that there's a lot of value because I don't want people just coming into a room and just hearing people talking over each other and not getting anything coherent because I always want to deliver value to the audience. And I always want the speakers to feel like they're, that it's worth their time, right? They want to come back because they got a good experience too. So uh, I think that Twitter spaces, um, I just want to continue getting, you know, building bigger and bigger there. Um, I want to do full conferences. I want to do full, uh, bring on, you know, CEOs of the top companies. My goal is start to have people that are, you know, we're trading their stocks coming on and talking to us about the stock, right? Like a CEO should be able to come on to my Twitter space and chat and talk about their stock. Um, so that's really one of the goals for long term where it can go. We'll see how transparent they can be because they have SEC regulations. But I, I, my goal with Twitter Spaces is all about, I think that a lot of investors, they, 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 they tweet out a lot of stuff, but they often, it's hard to dig into the real meat and potatoes of what you want to ask them. So that's what I try to do. I try to ask them the real questions on my spaces to get the transparency to my audience. And I just want to keep doing that for more and more people. But then also on the flip side, I want my audience to feel more involved with me and feel like they have a better way to communicate with me. So that's why once a week, Basically, I do a spontaneous space, and I'll bring up four or five people who I don't know and just let them kind of talk and chat. Uh, so that way they feel connected to me. So I think it goes both ways. Okay, um, let's go back uh, just right into uh, your investment. So uh, what particular industry are you looking at right now? Uh, are you more concentrated in? Are you looking at uh, to be actually uh, having more potential for the future? Industry, what industry? Uh, I'm open to many different industries. Uh, I'm not industry dependent uh, whatsoever. Um, I do have a fascination with the sports betting industry, for sure. I'm, I'm very in tune with that. I think that there's a lot of potential. It's only legal uh, in about 10 states right now, so you have massive opportunity for growth. It's the type of thing where nothing has to be built in a state for it to move in and create hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue. All they have to do is legalize it, you don't need to build a, a railroad. You don't need to build infrastructure. You don't need to like do anything that you normally have to do to create hundreds of millions of dollars of tax revenue. All you have to do is change a bill. And it's not even that taboo. It's not like cannabis, which is another sector that I think is a great sector, but people have a lot of taboo around. Sports betting is just, listen, I'm throwing some money on my team, whatever. Like people, people have been doing it anyways. Um, so I, I really like that industry, but I'm in so many. I love the housing industry, even though it's overvalued right now. Um, I still think it has major potential. And then, I mean, how can you go wrong with things like consumer discretionary after you just saw what just happened over the past year? Like things like Walmart and Target, uh, they're not going anywhere. So, and then my last one I would say would be gaming. Gaming and it would kind of round that out. But I'm not, I'm not, I'm always open to learning about new tickers, new industries. I'm always open to education. My followers educate me every day. I do not know, uh, I, I know like 1% of everything out there. So I need people to bring me, you know, all the information that they have. Okay, uh, I, I will go right ahead. But I have one question in the comments and I'll just throw it out uh, before we continue. Someone is asking where would uh, World Financial be available in the UK? And I'm even wondering where would it get to uh, other parts of the world, even Nigeria, I mean, and Nigeria. So we want to know how to, uh, what happens with the app? When will it be available for every other person in the world? So that, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, it's, it's a variable timeline. I don't have an exact date for right now because our goal is to first nail down some of the. So, first off, the reason why it's only available right now in the US and Canada is because we work with Plaid, they're our partner. Uh, they're an API that allows you to connect to brokerage. And Plaid mainly works with brokerages in the US and Canada. So to us, we're, we're hoping that Plaid will expand to the UK because even if we expand to the UK, people won't be able to connect in. They, they, we don't have that data right now for stocks necessarily on those brokerages. So it's maybe not as of much use to them just yet. However, of course, there's social features. So my hope, my hope would be within the next year um, that we would be available in the UK. That would be great. I think that right now we still have a lot of work to do on the app. It's just in beta right now. So 
I think within the next three to six months, we're going to get a lot of our features sharpened up. We're going to get a lot more people on the platform, hopefully hundreds of thousands. And then we can really look into, okay, let's move into the UK. But I will say it's very highly requested. I got a DM about it today asking me when it's going to be available. I don't have an exact date. It just depends on Plaid and us also, you know, fixing up what we currently are working on because we want people to have the best experience possible when they first use the app. So that's why we're not uh, allowing it to everybody just yet because we want to kind of um, work our way out and make the app better first so people get a really ideal experience. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, so uh, let's get back to you. You talked about uh, sports betting. Uh, let me just get what your favorite uh, sports betting stuff right now. Uh, Pen, Pen, yeah, uh, Pen National what? Gaming. Uh, Pen, P E N N, is the ticker. It's Pen National Gaming, and they own part of Barstool Sports with Dave Portnoy. So that's why it's. And I see, I see the comments also. I see that some people in the UK do invest in U.S. stocks, and I acknowledge that. Um, I, it's just right now. There's also, uh, I'll also explain for the UK. There's regulatory pieces to it, so you have to be. I think it's called like GDPR or something compliant with uh, data regulations. So right now in the U.S., it's a lot easier. So I run all of our legal operations as well. Uh, I take care of if we need terms and services and agreements and data privacy and things like that. I, I write all those. And it's just very complicated for the U.K. You have to give a lot more access to people's data to them. Um, you have to it, – it's just a lot more processes to build in. So right now, the U.S., from a data perspective, is much more friendly for us um, not that we do anything with people's data. It literally just sits in a database. Like it just, you know, is in case we need to contact someone or, and they can always request to erase it at any time. And we will erase data. We've done it for people, but it's just very complicated from a legal perspective to move into other countries. Um, but on the sports betting, Penn National Gaming is fantastic. I, I was been, I bought at $25. Then when it fell to $6 a share, I bought more at $6. And now it's been all the way to $140 a share. Um, but currently, I think it's sitting around 100. They fell underneath 100 recently because of the growth pullback. But I'm very fascinated with the stock. I did a podcast on the stock. It's uh, on my podcast with Stock Market Nerd, who has like 30,000 followers on uh, Twitter. So it's a great podcast. If anyone wants to learn about Penn, they should just go uh, ahead and listen to the podcast. It's called the Market Madness Podcast. It is on Spotify. All right. Thank you. Uh, before I go ahead, I just want to understand, how did you handle the downturn? You just mentioned it. Like, um, Everything was going down like crazy. Yeah, you telling what was the strategy to handle it? Uh, one more time. The downturn, the market downturn that happened recently. The Samsung, is that what you said? Yeah, the sell off, the sell off, the market sell off that happened. How did oh, you handle it? For the market sell off for Samsung stock? No, for, for the or... market, uh, there was a massive sell off in the market. How did oh, you gotcha. handle it? Yeah, so it's a good question. So it hasn't affected me too badly. Um, I was up, I'm up, I'm just looking right now, 18, I mean, I'm only down about 8% from the market sell-off from where I was. So it's really not that bad, right? It's only 8%. I mean, I kept a lot of my gains. I'm still up, uh, you know, well over 30% over the one year. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty happy with my position, you know, to make 30% in a year is very fine for me. I, I'm personally not the type of person who goes out and tries to make 50 to hundred percent a year. That's just not my strategy. Um, I'm very comfortable making 10% a year, uh, because I have time, right? I don't have to, I'm not 40, 50, 60 years old. I don't have to make 10% and think about it that way. Um, I have so much time. If I make 10% every year, I'm going to be a multi, multi-billionaire. Like it's, there's, there's no problem to me with making a small amount. So to me, being up 30%, it's like what market sell off, you know, it's, it's, I think it's just healthy right now. So, uh, I, I tried to buy, I tried to buy the dips. I mostly added, I will say I mostly added to crypto during the market sell off because I've become more and more confident in crypto. So I, 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 I'm to me, like right now from where it's sitting, like it's not even like a massive market sell off. Like I'm certainly not, I'm certainly not down. I mean, I'm still positive even over my three months. So it's nice. Okay, uh, so how many stocks do you have in your different uh, portfolios? Like, how many stocks do you handle at once? Right, it, 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 so it depends on the portfolio. So my one portfolio, my Roth, I try to keep to like 10, but my swing my swing portfolio is all over the place. I have like like 30 stocks in here, and then yeah. uh, another four cryptos, so really all over the place. And then my OTC account, usually five. Is there any criteria for the number or just... Uh... 
Uh, no criteria. Yeah, no, no specific criteria. I think that I like the idea long term. I like the idea that all of my stocks, I'll have in depth knowledge into them. Um, so you know, it's hard to do that with more than ten to twenty stocks. So to me, um, I, I will say my Roth, the positions are a little bit larger, which is why I try to keep it to ten. And then for OTCs, they're very volatile, which is why I try to keep it to five because you don't want to be in a bunch of ones, to be honest. But for my Robinhood, where I have 30 to 40 stocks, they're all, in my opinion, they all have potential. And they're honestly, they're not that big of a position, all of them. Maybe I'll put, you know, um, somewhere from like $500 to $1,000 in each position or something like that. And I'll just, that way I can keep an eye on it. You know, it's on my radar. I'm paying attention. And if the company has some crazy news or something that changes my opinion about them, then I can go and I can add to the position. But it's it's more to just keep it in the back of my mind, keep me focused on it. Um, they're not they're not massive positions. So you know, if if one of them was to tank and I lose fifty percent, it's just a couple hundred bucks usually. Um, so I'm I, I, I that's that's fine. It's more of a learning experience for me. And then I learn from that. And then when I'm confident, I transfer something into my Roth. Okay. Um, before I go on with the questions I have here, I just want uh, for the people because a lot of people are coming from uh, the Nigerian state and. It's not had any experience uh, with the uh, World Financial App, so they are wondering what does the World Financial App do? Can you just uh, take a minute to explain what it does so the people can check it out maybe after the chat? Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, I know that a lot of people are very familiar with FinTwit, right, the finance Twitter community, and I'm a very engaged in FinTwit, and to me, I really liked it, but I thought that there could be a lot of things that make it better, and so that's what we try to do with the Wolf App. So essentially on the Wolf App, you get a social media, so just like you have with Twitter, your posts, your retweets, your comments, but you also have video. So like TikTok, where you have that ability, ability to have like 60 second videos, so you get both text and video, and then you also have your portfolio. So you connect in your portfolio, we pull it into the app, and you can share your portfolio as content. So now I can go in and imagine if on Twitter, right, we could see like all these people could just share their portfolio right there. So we could see it every day. We could see what they're trading, see their transactions, see the risk levels. Um, and then we do research in app is the third thing. So you have portfolio, you have social media, and you could do your research. So we allow you to easily do research. And the goal for us was so many people are getting into stocks, but they don't have finance backgrounds. So when you tell them, look at the fundamentals, that doesn't mean anything to them. It, they, you tell them, go read a 10K, go read a balance sheet and income statement. It's meaningless. It's just words and numbers and it's meaningless. So what we did was we tried to take all that data and transform it into graphs and make them very easy to understand with one or two sentences. So you can look at it and say, all right, I don't understand what it means that free cash flow is $100,000, but I can look at a graph and see it going up over time and understand that the company's in a good position because I can read one or two lines of words, you know? So for us, it's a way to teach people how to do research on the Wolf app without having to have a finance background. And we have many more things coming in. We're also gonna allow people to sell content in app. So it's something that you can't do on any major social media right now. You'll be able to sell content if you're a verified user. And we're also building it with a ton of creators so we're bringing in all their favorite features, and then hopefully they'll bring over their audiences. Okay. That's fantastic. So you are, you are basically uh, simplifying and um, making fundamental analysis easier for everyone. What did you say? Yeah, you are simplifying and making fundamental analysis. It's normally bulky. You're making it easier for everyone. Yes, exactly. That's correct. It's it's financial analysis combined with social media, so it's for everybody, and it's free. Okay, uh, let's go to crypto. Uh, what are your favorite uh, coins so far? And, and what do you think? What do you think about the crypto space? And the next thing is, where do you see the crypto Yeah, I, I love the crypto space. I'm very, very um, heavily invested in crypto. It's at least, uh, I think, about 15 to 20 percent of my net worth is inside of crypto currently. Um, I'm inside of Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Bitcoin Cash. Uh, I have a couple thousand Dogecoin just in case. Um, so I didn't fully understand crypto until more recently. Uh, over the past couple of months, I've actually done a deep dive into crypto to try to understand it. And mostly that's through my podcast where I interview people. And what I understand now is why there is such a need for crypto 
and to have that in existence, especially, I think Bitcoin is a massive one, um, but people don't understand the need for Ethereum. Ethereum is so potent and there's so much built on top of the blockchain. So I, I won't go down the rabbit hole right now because I'm not the crypto expert or anything, but what I do understand is that w with how much money the US government is printing right now, uh, and it's, essentially I saw record numbers such as it's possible that 25% of all money in existence has been printed over the last year. Um, we need to have alternatives that people can utilize and crypto right now, to me, is one of those alternatives. And there's also other massive uses for it in the future as people get better and more involved in the technology space where um, money transfers and smart contracts, which is a, a massive area of Ethereum where you can have sports betting. Like, I love the sports betting industry. Sports betting industry could, in five to ten years, be built on top of crypto. Like, I think that people don't realize... A lot of my favorite industries go hand in hand with crypto. It just hasn't happened yet. So I'm trying to get in early because I still think it's early for crypto. Um, I don't think that we're going to, to me, crypto is at least a 20 to 30 year hold. Wow. Okay. What do you see uh, about, I always like to ask people uh, about NFTs. Uh, are you buying any NFTs currently? And where do you see, do you understand the concept? And where do you see it in the next five, 10 years? Um, I actually had a tweet uh, saying that NFTs is going to be the way we do anything charity. And it's already happening. I said that tweet about uh, I said that tweet about a month ago. Now a lot of people that donated to the India uh, COVID uh, relief actually did it through NFTs. So where do you see yeah. NFTs going? And do you understand the concept? Are you actually investing in NFTs? I, I do understand the concept of non fungible tokens, where you utilize the blockchain to certify that an item is number one of one or yeah. two of one, where yeah. you can say I'm the only one who owns the original of this. Um, I don't currently own any NFTs. I don't because I see NFTs right now similar to an IPO. So yeah. a company comes out, the IPO, it's, it's hot, right? It flies up 50, 60%, 100% because people don't know what it's worth, right? They're, they're saying, wow, Airbnb, it just came out. Like, wow, let me buy this. But then it falls, right? Because it comes back to earth. And then you give it a couple of months and it builds a base. And you can look at it and say, all right, I believe that, you know, we're seeing value now. Because right now, what people are paying for NFTs, they're probably not going to be able to sell them for that much in the future. That's yeah. the only reason, right, to buy one of these things is to sell for yeah. more. Um, if you're if you're a finance person, so I don't I don't buy into it right now. But I do think that the concept is here long term, and the concept yeah. has value to it um, once the valuations become more realistic. Um, as for charity, that's a fantastic idea. I had not heard of that. I I'm not sure. I'm not sure why NFTs would be used um, for charity over just donating the money. Are you? Yeah. No, no somebody, uh, somebody would just uh, make maybe a picture or a, an art representation and the person would say, okay, uh, who is going to be to buy this? All the money that is going to, uh, I'm going to get from this is going to be donated to charity. So a lot of people will mm -hmm. buy that and then they will hold the original copy of the artwork or uh, as an evidence that they, they, they donated to charity at some point and all that. That's how it works actually. That's a very cool idea. Okay, I like that idea of creating an NFT, saying I'm going to sell this for charity. Um, I think that that's kind of been being done. Like, just not, it, they just, it just hasn't been an NFT, right? People have created paintings for decades, right? And so this yeah. is going to go to charity. So exactly. you're just, it, it's just a way to convert it to electronic and digital form for charity. Yeah, so I do like that idea. I think that there's other abilities for NFTs. For example, um, digital diplomas, right? People go to college. You get your digital diploma. It's an NFT. I own this on the blockchain. It's my diploma. Um, there's ne maybe no value to it, but it's cool, right? It's certified yours. It's not a fake. Um, I see different other uses even beyond just buying and selling things. Yeah, I like the digital diploma idea, and I wish we could sell it. Some people just sell their diploma certificate. <laughs> okay, uh, that's right. nice. Okay, uh, let's look at uh, some other... Um, some, do you believe in investment teams and... Um, do you believe in investment teams? Like uh, this team is actually in vogue for the market at the moment. And then after some time, another team will be in vogue. Uh, do you believe in teams? And do you follow any team uh, for your investments right now? Investment teams. Uh, themes? Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, I do believe in investment themes. I think right now, obviously, like small cap growth is definitely a theme. Um, I don't think that investment themes have to be exclusive. I think that there's still a plenty of value to the FANG stocks, um, which are massive market caps. And you can also 
go after the small cap growth. I think that there are themes, though. I fully agree. Uh, I do like getting in on the themes personally because I'm a big believer in the people's ability to move the market. And retail traders have more power now than ever in history to move the market. In fact, um, the amount of retail traders in the market uh, more than doubled last year. So you went from having a, 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 a capital-wise at least, um, you went from having a relatively small position of market movement to a much larger. And while you still cannot move a FANG stock such as Apple or maybe Google, you can move small cap stocks for sure. So I, I think that there's a lot of value, especially in my swing trading account, right, where I might be holding something for a couple of weeks to say, there's a theme here, people are getting in on this, they're coming in, let's find some hot stocks, let's move with it. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, if you like, like, we're all trying to do the same thing. We're trying to make money, right? Like, it's yeah. if I do it differently from someone else, uh, so what, right? So yes, there are definitely themes, absolutely. And it's valuable to be in touch with them. Okay, uh, what conditions will make you buy an IPO? You just said uh, a little while ago that uh, IPOs, they just go up and then they go down. So what special yeah. conditions will make you say, okay, this IPO, or I'm just going in on it? Or is there no condition at all that you see and say, okay, I'm buying an IPO? Have you ever bought an IPO? Yeah, yeah. So for me, one of the things that I actually own is I own, there's an ETF called IPO. Okay. And what they do is they buy a group of IPOs and they consistently put in new items. So you can look up the IPO ETF holdings and let's see. So Renaissance Capital LLC IPO ETF. Um, let's see what they have right now. Uh, I'm not seeing, uh, I'd have to look up like their top 10 holdings, but that's one of the ways that I get my, um, my uh, exposure to the IPO area. However, um, I don't typically buy IPOs. As I said before, I like to give them time to form a base. The only times when I have bought IPOs is something that it's a, it's a company that I personally use and I'm very in tune with. And I look at it and I do a little bit of due diligence into it as a private company in their background. And I say, you know, this has the ability long term. Um, I'm very hesitant to buy IPOs of things that I don't have personal experience with. Um, but it doesn't mean that they're not on my radar. Just because you don't buy something doesn't mean that you can't be heavily invested in it from a time perspective. For example, um, just yesterday, there was uh, the company that, or not just yesterday, two days ago, the company, I put it on my watch list, that owns UFC, the company that owns UFC and EuroLeague, uh, IPO'd. Um, very under the radar. It's called Endeavor, I think. Yeah, Endeavor Group. Uh, what is it EDR. EDR. So Endeavor Group IPO'd two days ago, I think. Um, their first day they dropped like 12%. The next day they were back up like 12%. So they're sitting right there. The thing is, I love the UFC. I think it's awesome. I like watching the fights. I love the um, UFC too. Yeah, exactly. And EuroLeague is great as well. So there's a lot of like good things here. However, you look at the stock and you have two days of data. Um, it's just not enough for me to look at it and want to buy right now. So I want to see what the stock does over the next three months. And then I want to look at their, I want to see them report earnings, right? And I want to look at it and say, all right, you're a public company now. What are you doing with the money that you got from going public, right? You get a lot of money when you go public, you're selling shares. What did you do with that money? Has your stock reacted well? Um, and, and what's your publicity like, right? Because your stock nowadays, it needs to be popular too. Like people need to be talking about it and stuff. I don't want to be buying into things that nobody's ever, nobody cares about. Um, so that's like some of the things that I'm waiting on. So I have my exposure through the IPO ETF and then I very carefully purchase other IPOs, but I still do my research. Okay, uh, that's nice. Okay, um, the next question is, that what, what has been your biggest winner so far uh, since you started investing? What has been your biggest winner? So if I, if I, if I had taken profit, uh, Plug Power would have been my biggest winner. Um, unfortunately, they've come down significantly, which is so sad because... I bought into Plug Power at two dollars and eighty cents, and they hit over seventy dollars a share. Yeah. Um, so that was one of my biggest. Um, I also had a lot of Dogecoin at like a cent. Um, so I mean, I made like five hundred percent on that, I guess. Uh, besides those other biggest winners, uh, I'm did just you, did, you take, did you take did you take profits from your Doge uh, before it went down? Uh, yeah, yeah, I did. Um. Let's see, other ones that are some of my biggest winners. 
Um, I, I think I did pretty good on Snapchat, pretty good on Tesla. Um, I got into Tesla pretty early. I was looking at Tesla back in 2018. And then, um, yeah, like Snapchat, Tesla, Twitter, ARKK, like some of the, a pen, like those are some of my biggest winners for sure. Okay. In the what's, social media. What's your biggest yeah. loser? Uh, my biggest loser, I think I eventually just got rid of it, but SNDL, Sundial, I just couldn't oh. like, I just, I just didn't even like, I was in the stock. I didn't know why I was in the stock. Like sometimes you just make a mistake, you know, you're just like got caught up in it and yeah. you don't do enough research and you start. And then I don't want to be like, I'm not trying to bag hold my way back to positive gains. You know, yeah. eventually I look at it and say, there's so much better opportunity. This stock's not doing anything. I mean, if I look up the stock right now, SNDL, um, yeah, they're all the way. See, it's a good thing I sold because I sold <laughs> at a loss, but now it's another like 50% down. So to me, like it was my biggest loss probably was SNDL, yeah. but I'm still glad that I sold and yeah. didn't lose more. Okay, so at what percentage do you decide that this stock is actually not good and uh, you sell it? Does it? Is there a percentage or does it have to be... Uh, when you look at the fundamentals, maybe the management and all that. Yeah. Yeah. It's not just about the percentage for me. It's definitely more about um, the fundamentals, the future of the stock, the ability for them to um, trade value. So I was looking at SNDL and, you know, I, I eventually realized like, you know, I had gotten into it because I was kind of like, oh, it's flying. Like everyone's talking about it. It's in the cannabis space. So there's, but I didn't really do enough research. And then I looked farther in and I looked at it and said, no analysts rate this a buy. Why aren't they rating it a buy? Everyone was rating it a sell or a hold. So I didn't like that. So I looked into the analysts and I see, okay, they're not blowing earnings out of the water. They don't have a competitive advantage in the industry. Uh, there's way better companies than them that may not have shown that type of growth. Um, so, you know, I was already down, I don't know, 50, 60% on the stock um, at that point. And I just said, I could see myself losing 90% on the stock. Yeah. I don't want to do that. So that's when I got out. But if there's other stocks that I am down on a good amount because of the growth sell-off, but I'm not planning on selling them regardless because I still believe in the stock. So like stocks like, um, let's see, stocks like um, even like Palantir or um, DMTK. Uh, these are stocks that I'm currently down on. I'm currently down on DMTK, but I fully understand exactly what the company wants to do. I, I believe in the mission. I believe in the product. s and the secondary stock offerings. I see in the chat. Yeah, Bobby, thank you. Um, yeah, they're, 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 no, they're no bueno. Um, so I, I can look at DMTK and say, all right, I'm down on the stock. It's not good. I'm down, gosh, probably 34% right now, like on that position. But I'm very confident in the three to 10 year holds, right? I can look at it and say, all right, I know what the stock's doing. They have a competitive advantage. They're spending money well. I'll, I'll hold because I don't believe I'm going to lose 80% on that stock, you know? So to me, it's a, it's a risk-reward trade-off. Okay, uh, so uh, I understand what you're saying. So do you really believe in opportunity costs? And then oh, yeah. uh, how big does a stock have to get before you say, okay, yeah, I'm cutting it down. Some people say, okay, at 15%, and uh, no matter the potential, I'm actually cutting up some, say, 30%. Do you have a, a percentage that you say, okay, no matter how big, I'm not going to allow this to go bigger than this? And do you believe in opportunity cost? I, I definitely believe in opportunity cost in every aspect of life. So not just the market. I think that factors into a lot of areas. I don't think that there's a specific percentage. Sometimes there's a price target. So, for example, with Penn, when I was in at $6 a share and it was flying and flying and flying, I, I, I did my research and I did like a bit of a DCF and I looked through some Goldman Sachs research and I picked $80 a share because that was actually Goldman Sachs. That was their price target. And I looked through it. And so $80 a share, I took profit. Now they continued on and they went up to 140, but it doesn't mean that I did the wrong thing because um, I, I was already up hundreds of percent on it, three, 400%. Um, so it's not necessarily a percentage rather as sometimes I pick a price target that I believe the company is worth based on, because, you know, the way that you value these companies, if you're doing a growth company, is you're valuing it based on future cash flows. You're taking the future cash flows that you predict out and you're discounting them back to the current day basis um, on the basis of some type of discounted uh, cash flow tracker. So you want to pick, all right, here's what I believe the WAC could be, the weighted average cost of capital, and here's the future cash flows. They're going to make X million amount each year. 
I'm going to discount that back, divide it by the amount of shares outstanding, and that is the price that I have for the stock. So sometimes I'll do that if I'm feeling like putting in the work, and I'll find the price, especially if it's something that I really believe in and I really want to fully understand, and then I'll take profit. But no, not like 15, 20%. Um, I'm simply not that methodical. Okay. All right. Uh, I just want to ask you about uh, some of the big competitions for pain. Uh, you said you're into the betting. Uh, DraftKings, what do you think of DraftKings and IRS and some of the other big competition? Do uh, you think that uh, Penn yeah. is actually going to be the winner in the industry? I think that there's room for both. Uh, I own DraftKings also, uh, in addition to Penn. Uh, if you look at them, they're each taking large market share percentage in all the states that they're moving into. So both of them might be getting 30-ish percent. Um, in my opinion, you know, as they continue to move into more markets, uh, so I, I like both of them because to me, the sports betting industry is, it's a casino, right? And the house always wins. So they're going to be money printing machines when everyone's betting on these because people are losing their money like this to the casino. Uh, number two, both of them have very good marketing. Um, unfortunately, DraftKings spends so much money on marketing that it's kind of ridiculous. Um, but they both have name brands out there, right? So Penn has it through Barstool. DraftKings just has, everyone knows DraftKings. Um, so I, I like both of them. I'm not, I, I don't own any other players in the area. Those are the two that I would pick, uh, to make the move. But to me, it's like, you have the ability to buy a mobile casino. Like that is, that is a money printing machine. So, you know, yeah. that's why I love that industry. Okay. Uh, before I go uh, back to the questions I already have, uh, the, do you, do you check, uh, the markets when you're buying, do you invest in emerging economies? And I'm not talking of China right now. A lot of people say China whenever you mention emerging. I don't believe uh, China is still an emerging con community because our uh, economy, because they are far gone. Uh, do you, like Mexico, South Africa, Nigeria, we do have some stocks in the uh, New York uh, Stock Exchange and NASDAQ. Do you invest in such companies? I'm much less familiar with them. Um, I think that's probably a bias based on the crowd that I'm surrounded with, right? Uh, they're just not talked about as often, so they don't come up on my radar. Um, I am familiar with several index and ETF funds that give you exposure to emerging countries and where you can just buy it overall. And those are what I'm more comfortable buying because um, sometimes I, I don't know where to find the financials, right? I don't know where to find all the data. Um, there's probably a lot of websites, but they're just not ones that I'm familiar with using. So to me, when it comes to emerging countries, I'm much more comfortable taking an index fund or an ETF and letting, a, letting an ETF manager, you know, work their magic because they're probably much more familiar with the region and the stocks in it than I am. So I certainly uh, don't claim to be an expert on U.S. stocks, but I have a decent basis of knowledge. So since I'm not an expert on those, I'm not going to, you know, even claim to have a decent basis of knowledge mm -hmm. in other areas and let someone else do it for me. Okay. Okay, that's fantastic. Uh, the next question, uh, let's just go straight to China. So what's your boot thesis on uh, FUTU? F-U-T-U. Yeah, so it's good good time to be asking because I'm actually going to be speaking on FUTU tomorrow um, on, a, on a Twitter space. And I'm just so bullish on FUTU because I love that industry. And it's, it's very similar to what Wolf is trying to do, right? So FUTU, uh, for those who aren't familiar, they're a technology online brokerage and wealth management platform but they also built in social features to the platform and they really took it to the next level. Um, you can have live streaming in platform. So people can come on and you can see traders all day on the platform live streaming, which is crazy. Like how much more people are gonna buy stocks now on the platform because they see someone else doing it. Um, it's like Reddit on there. You can ask questions, you can talk. Um, and then, I mean, when you look at their, their numbers, they're insane. Uh, so just, I have some numbers over here. I'm just gonna talk to you for a second. Uh, okay. Earnings. Earnings went up 880% uh, to $0.49 cents a share, beating expectations. This is for the last earnings, uh, wow. by $0.08. Cents. Revenue went up 283% to $153 million, also beating expectations. Um, net, they're, they're paying clients, so clients that are paying them for wealth management services, grew 161% um, for a total of over half a million paying clients. And then total client assets, so that's the amount of money that's in there, grew 227% to wow. uh, year over year to $36 million in the fourth quarter. Um, so absolutely just insane numbers. Um, for the whole year of 2020, uh, when you look at that, they had 212% uh, year over year revenue growth. Um, gross profit is the most insane number though. Futu's gross profit in 2020 grew 235%. Uh, that's, that's a crazy number. Um, 
their, their costs grew too. Their cost, their cost grew 147%. But think about that. If I can grow my cost by 147% and my, my profit margin by 235%, I'm doing really good. That's almost 100% yeah. more. Um, so to me, it's the fact that, one, I love the type of company. I think it's so potent. You know, I'm trying to get into this area myself of yeah. wealth management mixed with social. I think it's a potent mix. Two, they already built in live streaming, which is just so key. Like, I'm trying to build that into my platform. Trust me, it's going to take like a year. Like, it's such a hard thing to build. And then three, um, you know, all the fundamentals are there when you look at it. The, the And the data, I think that people have a lot of problems with um, data coming out of China. Uh, they're often worried that it's being tweaked with, that they're not getting um, the right financials. However, um, Futu uses PwC to audit their data. Um, they've been invested in by multiple large firms, so I don't believe would invest in them if they didn't have um, proper data and financials. So I'm just very bullish on the stock. I've been in since $45 a share. Then I think that they could hit 200 to 250 by the end of the year. Okay. Uh, my question is, uh, you actually talked about uh, PwC auditing them and all that. Now, a lot of people have a lot of bias investing in any company that's in China. Okay. What name, what's the name of this company? The company is actually uh, Futu, F-U-T-U. That's the ticker. Now, a lot of people yeah. have a bias uh, for any company in China because uh, a lot of their financial reports are actually not uh, straightforward. So uh, do you think uh, Futu is an exception? And how do you have a, a hitch uh, around that? Yeah, yeah. So I, I do think that Futu is, um, you know, I think that there's many exceptions. I'm sure that Futu is not the only one. Um, but when you look at it, I, I just, I'm just pulling up a couple of notes real quick because I, 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 I was actually going to talk about this. And that is, um, here we go. Um, they use PricewaterhouseCoopers as their auditing firm. And then they use um, Skadden, Arp, Slate, Meager, and Flom as their legal counsel. Uh, that's the name of the legal counsel. So both of these names are extremely reputable. Um, PricewaterhouseCooper as well as their legal counsel. Um, so to me, uh, those two names are, are just give me a lot of confidence. And then number two, um, their major investor is Tencent. Um, and Tencent is a $700 billion company who doesn't make, you know, they don't like mess around like that. They don't just throw out investments at companies that are giving them the wrong financials. Tencent does their research. Um, as I mean, think about it. It's like, it's like if Apple invested in the company, you know, you would trust that Apple did their research. Um, I, same thing for Tencent. I trust that Tencent did the research. So between their auditor, their legal counsel, and their investors, it gives me a lot of uh, confidence in the numbers. And even if their numbers are still being smudged, even if they were 50% lower, they're still very incredible. So they're still doing a great job, even if their numbers aren't even as good as they're saying. Yeah. Okay. I actually had a, a position in Futu, but I just traded it uh, for a day. Uh, I bought it. Uh, it went up, I think, 20% 20 in one day. Uh, I sold it, and the next day it even did more. So I was like, why did I even sell? I think it's a fantastic company anyway. Okay. Um, let's just uh, look at um, what, are the, what are some of your favorite stocks at the moment, apart from the gaming industry. Do you have any other stock that you're looking on to... Like do a little more research on. Let me just get like three, three of your favorite stocks at the moment. Yeah. So this other stock that I mentioned before, um, Endeavor. So it's the the one I just mentioned, uh, where it's EDR. Uh, I really want to look more into them. Like I said, they own UFC and Euro League. Um, they've got multiple other uh, companies as well inside of there. They own uh, experiences and events that they operate, such as the Miami Open. Um, there's not a ton of data right now. Like I said, they obviously don't have a PE ratio. They're only in market cap. Their market cap's not even 600 million. So this could be getting into a company that's really small with a lot of growth potential, right? Like usually we're looking at companies that are maybe sub 5 billion. They're sub 1 billion. Um, and with the UFC, who's paying fighters hundreds of millions of dollars. Yeah. So that's a company I want to look into. Um, number two, I just added to Twitter um, once they fell. Uh, if Twitter falls again on Monday, I'm going to buy... 2022 call options for January um, because they'll, I mean, Twitter just fell 14%. Um, if they fall another five or 6%, there's no way they stay down there. Um, that company is way too big. They, they, they're introducing a uh, finally after 10 years, they're introducing ways to make money with the platform. Um, yeah. I don't know if you, I, I talked with the Twitter spaces team. They're going to be introducing tipping for the spaces. Wow. So, and it, and possibly the ability to charge to enter a space. Um, That's fantastic. So, so yeah, so Twitter, and then I started a position in pins, so Pinterest, 
last week. I, I've been doing a lot of research in them for a long time. Uh, thanks. And Bobby just mentioned that Futu also is looking very good from a technical analysis standpoint, holding yeah. on their 50 day, um, moving average. And, um, uh, besides pins, I guess one other company that I've just been keeping my eye on, uh, probably Riot. You know, I do own Riot, but it's such a volatile company. I really want to understand yeah. it better. They have a lot of exposure to crypto. Um, yeah, you know, they're, they're, yeah, they're miners with blockchain. So Riot's a company that I really want to under understand better. So those are some areas outside of sports betting that I'm looking at, you know, whether it's in pins or, um, and obviously, you know, SE, but everybody is SE. Yeah. All right. Uh, before you go, uh, because I, I we're already one hour in, I don't want to take so much of your time. I want to know no what worries. is your biggest holding in, in cryptocurrency and um, in the stock uh, in the stock market. Which stock is your biggest holding uh, so far? And then uh, what is your biggest coin? Yeah. So they're kind of related, actually. So my okay. biggest my biggest coin is Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Um, I I own about three and a half times as much Bitcoin as Ethereum that I own. Um, I've been, I've been in Bitcoin. Uh, I started getting in around 14 K, um, and just bought kind of all the way up. And now we're, you know, we're close to 60. So it's been really fun. Cause that's a nice, some nice gains. Um, uh, I really feel like over the past month or two, I've gotten a much bigger appreciation for Bitcoin and an understanding for the value of the coin and the scarcity that's going to be able to achieve. Um,